So yeah, this is what an Emilio looks like. Uh, so, so was it, I wasn't being replaced by the video though, is that right? I was just, okay, I wasn't sure if I was gonna get to speak or not. Testing. One, two, three, got it on? Okay, see, I figured it out, it was a test, but I, I passed it. So, you know, obviously we have to keep uh, Pastor Greg in prayer with COVID. But I got to tell you, last summer, if he said he's able to still taste. Last summer, I wound up with COVID, only I didn't know I had it. And we have two dogs, and I let the dogs out one night, you know, late at night before going to bed. And one dog comes back, is acting funny, running around in circles and everything. And I said, boy, that's kind of strange. And I almost let it in the house, and my wife came by and said, no, don't, don't let him in. And she came out, and she goes, can't you smell that? The dogs had been sprayed by a skunk, and I, I couldn't smell it. So I, I could have really been a COVID-related death, because if I let that dog in the house, <laughs> you, you can relate to that? You know what that, okay, so. It has nothing to do with Psalm 116, but it does talk about being near the throes of Sheol and the throes of death, so it might be more appropriate than I thought. Okay, let's open in a quick word of prayer, if you don't mind. Lord, we just praise you and thank you tonight. We just honor you. We want you to have your way in what's said and done, Lord, that, that your Ruka Kodesh, your Holy Spirit, would just alight on each of us here as on the day of Pentecost, and that we'd come away refreshed and renewed, having been in your presence. Use this vessel, Lord, one more time for your honor and glory. Amen. So when I came down here, I, I, I appreciated your testimony there, brother. It was really special about appreciating the Jewish ministries. In case you haven't noticed, I'm, I'm a little older than you. I'm pretty sure I have shoes older than you, for that matter. But the, the, the key is that I had studied the word, uh, I've been a teacher since I'd gotten saved. I, I'm an engineer by training, so I took a very analytical approach to the word. I was led to the Lord by a, a professor of engineering. <clears throat> and, the, and the point was that I, I always studied it that way, but I never knew anything about the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith. Until one day I came across a Zola Levitt pamphlet on the Feast of Passover. And I read it, and I said, this is amazing. So, you know, you start pulling that thread, and, and it just becomes something else. And so here was this goy, this uh, Gentile, Italian Gentile, you make it even worse, right, <laughs> trying to, you know, we're doing seders and all that, and we'd have some Jewish people come to the seders, and they say, oh, that was very nice, except you butchered every Hebrew word you tried, <laughs> you know, so, so I, I couldn't do any of it. But when I, uh, I as I got to the point where I, I knew enough, I we were going to retire, we knew we were going to move, and the Lord led us here. I said, oh good, I'm going to the south. I will be the missionary to the Bible Belt and teach them all about the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith. Little did I know, they discovered it without me. <laughs> and you have people that you know are far more knowledgeable and very impressive, and some of them, like Pastor Greg and the other Pastor Greg, are even Jewish, you know, so they know how to say the words, you know. <laughs> But the point is that when you start studying the Word of God through the lens of the roots of the Old Testament, right, it, it comes to light. How many people here remember uh, black and white TVs? Okay, it's a shame some of you don't, don't even know what I'm talking about. Okay, and then all of a sudden you go and now you have, uh, you, you know, you, you get color TVs, and that was pretty exciting when you make the change. But then have you ever gone to... Uh, you got a high definition TV. They're kind of, you know, everybody probably has one now. But you click through the stations, and all of a sudden you go through a normal station, then you hit high def, and everything just illuminates. That's what studying the word, the way we do it, Havdalah, and the ministry that Pastor Greg and the whole Jewish ministry, the whole team bring to our lives here. So it makes it that much more special, I think, when you see the word of God through that prism, through that lens. So hopefully, uh, that's what we'll continue to do, and tonight we're going to look at Psalm 116. Uh, Pastor uh, did Psalm 115 last week, and I just wanted to keep the, uh, the momentum going, and next week he'll, he gets to do the shortest psalm. He couldn't have gotten sick next week, or I could have done the short one. <laughs> he leaves me with a difficult one and a long one, but it's okay. We have three hours, so I'll, I'll manage to, I'll, I, I will get it in. Don't hyperventilate. I was only kidding. I really don't. Okay, okay so let's, let's read. I, I, in the handout, I gave it to you in several different translations so you can see. There are some differences, but the theme is very much the same. We'll highlight some more of those differences we, as we go on. 
But Psalm 116, I'm going to read from the New King James Version. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. The pains of death surround me, and the pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and he saved me. Return to your rest, O oh my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord. Now in the presence of all his people, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O oh Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. So that's a pretty powerful statement. And before we get into it, I want to just uh, emphasize or review something that the pastor shared as we started this series on the Hillel. Okay, and I gave some descriptions there in the handouts. But it's described different ways. And we're going through Psalm 113 through Psalm 118, which is called the Egyptian Hillel. But uh, if, you ever, if you're familiar with the Siddur, which is a Jewish prayer book, there's one by uh, Rabbi Joseph Hertz, which is excellent. And he says some interesting things here. He says, Jewish songs of jubilation, this is what a Hillel is. They're Jewish songs of jubilation that has accompanied our wanderings of thousands of years, keeping awake within us the consciousness of our world historical mission strengthening us in times of sorrow and suffering, suffering, and filling our mouths with song of rejoicing in the days of deliverance and triumph. So for all the turmoil that the Jews have gone through down through the years, they have these songs of, of, of the Hillel, right? As uh, Pastor Greg says, this is part of his 150 uh, playlist, his favorite playlist, right? What they would sing, and they would do different songs at different times. The Hillel sounding the whole gamut of trust and despair, dejection and triumph, agony and release, with praise running through the whole, retells to Israel the story of his checkered national life. Rejected by the builders, yet becomes the cornerstone of God's house. See, the Jews believe that Israel is the cornerstone of God's house. But we know Messiah, Yeshua, is that cornerstone that the builders rejected. Taunted as a people God-forsaken, yet securing God's love drinking the dregs of affliction, yet bearing the cup of salvation to his lips. So we're studying the Egyptian Hillel. And it's because of the, the references to Egypt, or the remembrance of Egypt. Okay, they're always, it's a zikaron, they're, they're always looking back at that experience and everything they do. The feasts are centered on that. Okay? So the Hillel of Egypt, because of the reference in them. Okay? Recited in the synagogues during the pilgrim feasts. Again, pastors spend a lot of time talking about this. Uh, Passover, Shavuot, uh, Sukkot, Shemni Atzeret, the eighth day, Yang HaAzamut, Israel's Independence Day, and Hanukkah. And they did that since the, uh, since the days of the Maccabees when, when that was actually instituted. But they don't do it for Purim because they believe that the scroll of Esther is really uh, their Hallel for that. Okay? And as shared previously, they omit... Uh, verses 1 to 11 in both Psalms 115 and 116, the one we did last week and the psalm we're doing tonight, and they call it a half Hillel for the last six days of Passover and Rosh Kodesh, the new moon celebration. So the question is, why do you think they do that? At least I was curious as to why that was. And it's because that even though the Egyptians were cruel to them, the fact that life was taken and they died, it says in the Siddur, that because the calamity that befell them, the Egyptian host pursuing the Israelites. So they do that almost in honor of them, right? They're fallen. So that's why you don't re recite those uh, during the, those last six days of, uh, 
of uh, the Passover holiday and uh, unleavened bread. Okay? So Psalm 116 is the second hymn sung by Jesus after his meal. There is no command in the Torah uh, to read the Hillel. Okay? They've done it forever, but there's not a command. You won't find it in the Torah. It's an early rabbinic tradition. And you might say, well, you know, why do they do that? How do they uh, get authority to do that if it's not in, in the Torah to sing those songs? And they use this stipulation. It's called the given us command. And the rabbis invoke Deuteronomy 17.11 when they do it. 17.11 says, according to the sentence of the law in which they instruct you, according to the judgment which they tell you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left from the sentence which they pronounce upon you. And so the idea is that the, the priest would give them instructions, the people were to follow it, and therefore that became a law to them. So the instruction was given to do the Hillel, so they followed that faithfully to this day. Okay? So this is an interesting psalm. You're going to find some, uh, you're going to see that he goes from the pits of despair to the heights of rejoicing and how he offers himself to God. I think we've all been there at one time or another. But there's some things in there that are uh, a little out of place. Matter of fact, one of my favorite verses is in the middle of this, and we're going to talk about that, because you're going to have to ask the question, why is it there? But I always enjoy when I look at different commentaries or different Bibles that have titles to get a feel for what, how that interpreter feels the Scripture is describing the text that follows. And so a few of the titles and themes, the Jewish Study Bible, for instance, says the topic is Thanksgiving for Healing. The Tree of Life says lift up the cup of salvation. Another says be at rest for the Lord is good. Thanksgiving for deliverance from death. Paying the vow of gratitude. How can I repay him? He heard my voice. All these are true straight statements and are accurate descriptions, but the key is that what's going on here is that there's an honoring of God through going through a difficult time of despair. So the context of this is that the psalm is thanking God for saving him from a life-threatening crisis. Now, we don't know what it is. He talks about being at death's door, so to speak. He talks about being at Sheol. We'll talk about what that word means to, uh, to a Jew. But we don't know if it was an illness, if he had some other catastrophe or tragedy in his life that he was pleading to God for. But at the end of the day, God delivered him. And the character of this psalm is interesting. And by character, I mean, you know, what's the context in which it's applied across the other psalms? And it's anthological, where an anthology is really a collection of similar things. So I put together a little chart here for you that you could see Psalm 56, Psalm 18, Psalm 116, the one we're studying. And the idea is that what we're trying to accomplish here is there's other Psalms that could be added, but I just want to give you a flavor for some of the consistency across these themes, these themes of Psalms. For example, the subject of vows in Psalm 56. You see it show up a couple times in Psalm 116. For you have delivered my soul from death. That same phrase is, is showing up in Psalm 116. You've delivered me from death. The concept of loving God, which we'll talk about in a minute, is here, as well as in Psalm 116. The pangs of death surround me. So this is not the only psalm that deals with times of uh, distress and near sorrow. The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me, the snares of death. And again, you see this author perhaps pulling from the other psalmists in writing his tale of woe and then uh, recovery, if you will. So let's get into the actual text then. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I'll call upon him as long as I live. So I want to stop here in verse 1. We're not going to do a lot of word studies, but I think it's interesting that this starts off with the psalmist proclaiming his love for God. We know that God delivers him, but there's several words for love in the Old Testament, Hebrew words. But the word here is ahav. 
And it's used to affirm God's compassion for man. It has to deal with the relationship between a mother and her children, the protective nature of God. So he's acknowledging that God has been that protector in his time of need and has reached out and delivered him when he cried out to him. That's as opposed to words like hesed, which is sometimes interpreted as loving kindness, which is really the covenantal kind of love, where they're in a relationship and it's a loving relationship. This is the mother-child kind of relationship that he's talking about here. And then he goes on to say that he inclined his ear. And when I hear incline, I, I, I look up verbs like that because I want to know what it's talking about here. He inclined his ear. Well, that act of inclination, inclining, is the Hebrew word nata, nata, which means to stretch out. So I don't know about you, but as I study the Passover and Exodus and throughout Exodus in many places in Deuteronomy, that concept of stretching out, I think of the arm stretching out, the arm of the Lord being stretched out. And you know what? It's the same word. That goes in there. So hopefully you'll appreciate what I'm about to share here, that uh, Exodus 6, 6, Therefore say to the children of Israel, again, this is Passover talk. Remember, Jesus is speaking this at Passover. They say this psalm, along with the others, at Passover. So this concept of redemption from uh, Egypt is very fresh in their minds. So what's going on here? Say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I rescued you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Okay? That word arm is a zoroa. So it's outstretched, and it's an arm. And as I go down this little rabbit trail, the, the, the emphasis that I want to make here, the point I'm trying to share with you, is the fact that whether it's an outstretched ear or an outstretched arm, it's under God's protective covering, okay? The term is a zoroa. And since the destruction of the temple, when you go to a Passover Seder, what's sitting right there smack dab in the middle of your, uh, of your Seder plate? There's a shank bone of a lamb, right? And it's been there for years. It was there this year at Passover in most Jewish homes. But people don't realize that there's a term for that, and it's called a zoroa. Well, Zeroa means arm, as in the arm of the Lord. Okay, so here's Jesus now, after having completed the Passover meal, walking to the Garden of Gethsemane, talking about the arm, the arm of the Lord, right? Or the inclined ear, remembering the concept of inclination, stretching out, and what do you have? You have, it's a, a pointer to Yeshua, and how do we know that? Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report? And to who has the, what? The Zeroah, the arm of the Lord, that outstretched arm, been revealed. <coughs> For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised, rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. As we hid, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised, yet we did esteem him... We did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded or pierced, as it says in the NIV, for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Who's it talking about? It's talking about the Mashiach, the Messiah. Is it not? It's talking about Jesus. So here we have images, flashes, shades of Jesus Yeshua, right here in this very psalm, at least as I meditate on it, I certainly see that. And you're going to see there's going to be other such inclinations, and it's even more powerful when you realize that this is what Yeshua himself was saying as he walked to the garden, right? So he finished his meal, and he walked out, but the inclined ear. So here's the psalmist saying, God inclined his ear to me. God reached out to me and heard him. Now, that concept of outstretch, you don't just see it relative to an arm. 
right? God's protection here. We're talking about God's protection and deliverance. This guy in this psalm, this psalmist is talking about God's protection and deliverance. But that word is also used to, to describe the wings. You know the wings? In, psalm, in Isaiah 8.8, 8, it talks about the stretching out of his wings. Now he's doing something... Uh, he's passing judgment on, on people at the time in this verse. But he's using that phrase of outstretching wings. And we know that wings infer protection as well. Right? This guy is looking for protection. He got protection. Psalm 91 should come to mind, for those who are familiar with, with this passage. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings, there it is, wings, you shall take reference, a refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. The word for wings is kanaf, okay? The concept of kanaf is also the term used to describe the corners of the tillit that the Jews would wear. The long white robes that have the zitzit, those fringes on the end, okay, which are called wings. You remember the woman with the issue of blood reached out and touched the zitzit, the wings, the corners of the garment. And Jesus said, I feel virtue flowing from me. Right? It's the same concept that this psalmist has as far as protection. God, the one that's like a mother that's protecting the little ones, hovering over the brood. You also see now, you see... The, the same taking place here in his use of words around the outstretched ear. And as you study the word, I mean, you could double click on this all night long and, get, and see more and more of this image. But for the purpose of tonight, I want you to appreciate the power of these simple words around love and around outstretched because he cried to the Lord and was received with an outstretched ear. Or an arm or a wing. It's that outstretching that makes the difference. It says, as long as I live, he will trust exclusively and worship him only. Continuing on, the pains of death surround me and the pangs of Sheol lay hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. Has anyone here been in a situation where you've had to call on the name of the Lord out of a situation of despair? Or am I the only one? So I think most folks can relate to that. And I just want to share with you that in my own case, uh, we've been relatively healthy. I, I remember one time uh, I had a, my, my one son was... Uh, had a very high fever, and he had gone into convulsions in the past when he had this high fever. And I remember, you know, laying over him in his bed and crying out to the Lord, just like this guy did, because I was afraid. You know, you, you don't know with little kids, he had a history. My wife carries a scar on her finger from when he had a convulsion and he chomped down on her. <laughs> she still has the mark because uh, she was trying to keep him from swallowing his tongue. But I cried, I was reading, I think it's Psalm 107, where it talked about under all these situations, these people cried out to the Lord. I didn't even know the circumstance. I didn't even understand the scripture that well at the time. But this notion of crying out to the Lord and, under difficult times. <laughs> Later in life, we had a, a situation where uh, one of our children uh, was diagnosed with, with MS. You know, things, uh, it, you know, we've cried out to the Lord and he, he, he's been fine. But boy, it's a scary thing. And I'm sure each of you have had situations in your life where you've had to cry out to the Lord. So we don't want to make light of the importance of this man's experience and our application of it in our own situation. Okay? But he was suffering from what's called the pains of death. And that phrase shows up in the New Testament. The concept of the pains of death. Peter used this on the day of Pentecost when the Rokh Kodesh fell on the 3,000, on them, and then the 3,000 were saved. 
and said, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed, guess what? The pains of death. So now you see images, flashes into the New Testament, again, of Yeshua, right, and what he did. Peter immediately made the connection and drew the, the line from what was happening there on the day of Pentecost and what happened to Jesus in particular on the cross back to this psalm, right, this ex very experience. And again, remember, Jesus was singing this psalm as he walked along and probably prayed in the garden. So they use the term here, Sheol. I don't know how you interpret Sheol, but I know that uh, we don't know what the man's experience was. We don't know if he was physically ill and almost died. We don't know if he had this large distress in his life. But Sheol, in Jewish thought, is the abode of the dead, and it usually refers to a common symbol for dire sickness or trouble. So he might have been sick, he might have just had a problem in his life, and he cried out to the Lord. Then it said in this passage here, it talks about the name of the Lord. So I don't know what it means to you, but when I hear the name of the Lord, I think of the name, Hashem, right? <laughs> Jews had such reverence for his name that they wouldn't even say it. Right? They, they wouldn't say the name, so they came up with these monikers like Hashem, the name. And to me, I think several places that are important that we need to remember when you think about the concept of the name is even in the Aaronic benediction. We're going to hear it later on tonight. But at the end of the Aaronic benediction, you know, it starts by saying, before they get into the benediction, God said to Moses to tell Aaron and his sons, the priests, to pray this, and then there's the ironic benediction. But then at the end it says, so they will put my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. So we do it every week here, and in a sense what's happening is it's a way of putting God's name on us. And when you think of God's name being applied, where did... God put his name. Where else did he put his name? It says in Deuteronomy, certainly in Christ, but if you look at Deuteronomy 16, it says, Therefore you shall sacrifice the Passover, the Lord your God, from the flock and the herd, in the place where the Lord chooses to put his name. And you see that a couple times in this chapter, and you see it in other chapters throughout Deuteronomy and elsewhere. It's a place where God put his name. And now, he didn't just put his name, say, I'm gonna, you're going to go there and I'm going to put my name there. But the important point is that God himself literally stamped his name on Jerusalem. You see, there's the intersection of three mountains there. Mount Zion, Zion, Mount Moriah, Moriah, and then the Mount of Olives. And it literally forms this, uh, like a arthritic Y. <laughs> The way it comes down, I don't know if that's a good way to put it or not, but, but uh, it's the Hebrew letter Shin, okay? And that Hebrew letter Shin has become the designation for God's name. It's where Shaddai comes from, but also if you ever had a mezuzah, the little blessing that you put on your door, what's on the back of it? A Shin, the letter Shin, okay? And I don't know how many of you are old Star Trek fans, but did you ever see when they... Uh, when, uh, what's his name? Yeah, you're doing, I can't do it too well. I'm, I'm Italian, I'm trying to talk and move my hands at the same time, right? That sign there, that's, that's the same, the reason that, was it Leonard Nimoy did that was because he was Jewish and he learned it in the synagogue because that's how the rabbis would bless them, by putting the letter Shin there. So God literally stamped his name on the land and I, when I, and I teach this uh, in other places where I've got uh, slides and everything. I, we've got the topographical view, and you can actually see the letter Shin emerge there, <laughs> right, right in the land. So he didn't just say, go there, because that's where I want to you know, build my temple. He did it because uh, he put his name there. So right about now, you should get a little tingly, because I am. And I don't think it's because I'm cold or warm or anything. I just think it's, it's, 
It's a powerful concept to me. All right? So think about this now, that when you are blessed at the end of the ironic benediction tonight, that God is literally placing his name. He's stamping his name on you, on his followers. So continuing on here with the scripture as we analyze it, <clears throat> Psalm 116, verses 5 to 8. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. Is there anyone here that can attest to that, that God has delivered them in such a way? Amen, amen, amen. So, this concept of being simple to, in Jewish thought, is the word petit. And it's young and naive, okay? In other words, no trace of merit, as some of the commentators, or one of the commentators mentioned. That there's no merit, you bring nothing to the table. And isn't that true? <laughs> in our walk with the Lord. We bring nothing to the table. It's all God. And he's acknowledging it here by, acknowledge, by saying and, and acknowledging his own simplicity that it's, for me to get out of the situation, it had to be all him, all Hashem, the name. He talks about rest, Manoah, coming to a stationary state after a period of movement, okay? Uh, return to your rest. Well, when you say return to your rest, there's a concept of movement, and then there's rest. Okay? It's uh, coming to a stationary state after a period of movement. So he's in the state of frustration, despair, fear, worry. And now he's saying, after he calls out the name of the Lord, now he gets returned to a state of rest. Every week with the Shabbat. Right, We're, We get tied up with all the stuff going on during the course of the week. But then we return to our period and time of rest. Do we not? Okay. An example of this is uh, <clears throat> it's found in Second, uh, First Chronicles. Now these are men whom David appointed over the service of song in the house of the Lord after the ark came to rest. There was movement and then it stopped. Okay. So you have this equation. This, I keep looking. I look for formulas because of my background. Okay, I, 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 I used to teach a course called Engineering Theology, which is like equations and graphs and stuff like that. And it's it's only for people like me and others have you know the drool would be forming in the corners of your mouth as I get into it. But but I look for these these equations, these, these linkages. And so you have before his. Experience here. He has the pain of death, the pangs of Sheol. He has trouble. He has sorrow. Pretty bad stuff going on in his life, does he not? But then he invokes the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord, save my life. Doesn't say anything about a bunch of sacrifices. You'll see that later on when he pays the vow. He makes a vow saying, Oh, Lord, if you get me out of this. But he invokes the name of the Lord, and invoking the name of the Lord, yields the following results. Be at rest once again, O my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. Be good to you. Delivered me from death, death, my eyes tears, and my feet are stumbling. Delivered me from death, my eyes tears, and my feet are stumbling. And what goes through my mind here is, here's Yeshua, who was resurrected and delivered from death. He was in the garden, probably sang this song right before he prayed, and it said he was in great agony. I imagine there would be tears that he cried. And when he was carrying his cross, he had to have someone help him because he was stumbling. So once again, the subliminal flashes, if you will, of Messiah in that very phrase. You see these themes emerging, right? You, the trick is to, to find the the thread, and start pulling on it, right? <laughs> and when you look at it in that line, all of a sudden, you see Jesus jump out of the page here. Now, Psalm 116, verses 9 to 11. Oh, boy. That, that, that can't be the, the right time. 
Okay, I'm sorry. All right, so I want to get to something really important, though, so we're going to skip over some of that because I, I need your help. I need you to explain something to me. I need you all to explain something to me. <clears throat> so here's this man that's toiling in, in all this trouble. God delivers him. He doesn't die. God delivers him. And then he goes and talks at the end there about him doing a vow. But in the middle of this, in verse 15, well, let's start in verse 12. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. What's that verse doing there? What is that about? No, really, I'm asking. I don't have the answer. I'm asking you. What, what, what do you think? I'll share with you some of the translators. Uh, and the reason why, why this is important to me is because I've comforted a lot of people, and I've gotten comfort for that myself when I'm able to tell folks, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So it's an important v verse. It's an important saying. We shouldn't minimize it in any way, shape, or form. But what is it doing there? So who's going to tell me? <laughs> It's very strange. Now, the way some people have interpreted this, okay, that precious is the word yakar, of high worth, precious, scarce, valuable. That's how it's literally interpreted. Everywhere you see it in the Bible, it's yakar. But the Jewish study Bible takes an interesting turn on it. It calls it grievous. The death of a saint is sad to the Lord. Other translations, like the New American Bible and the New Jerusalem Bible, use the term costly. It's costly. Well, how is it costly? The death of the faithful is costly or grievous to the Lord. Because when they die, their praise is silenced, and their witness in the land of the living is lost. So it's something to consider and ponder. Yeah, brother, go ahead. Sure, go ahead. I'll share it with everybody in a minute here. Okay, that's that's so good. I'm going to let you say it for those that might be watching, because you're doing a better job explaining it than I am. No, I'm not doing a better job. <laughs> um, as 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 I've read this scripture through the year, as I've read this scripture through the years. Uh, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. What has often come to me that this does not mean only that uh, death is a, from a physical standpoint, but it takes on something that Paul talked about, that I die daily in my walk with Christ and become more Christ-like and become more in his image. Wow, that, that's great. What does Dr. Jeremiah say? <laughs> Hold on a minute. We're going to hear Dr. Jeremiah. Go ahead, sister. <laughs> Uh, according to Dr. David Jeremiah, he says that uh, 116, 12 through 18 says that suffering is either focus the sufferer on God's blessing and provision or cause the person to flee from him. David ends the Psalms with four commitments that should be on the lips of every child of God. I will remember my vows to him. I will rem render my love to him. I will return my thanksgiving to him. I will receive his great salvation. And on 12, he says, praise often swells up in the context of adversity. Despite the difficult times David had been through, there is no discouragement there, but rather a psalm of praise and thanksgiving for what the Lord has given him. Well, that's great. That's great. I like both of those. Let's, let's pretend I said both of those things. Okay, let's pretend you heard those words of wisdom from me. That's great. So the important thing is I, I still think that's a very comforting passage of Scripture. And I think the way the, our brother just shared it, I think, brings it in, makes it a very personal context and, I, I, you know, a very personal application. And what you shared, sister, I think ties the, the whole theme of that psalm together. So thank you so much for sharing. 
So it's, we're right about at the time here. So I just want to say this here, <laughs> that in the end, he talks about offering a vow. He talks about a Thanksgiving offering, and he talks about a vow. And I just want to make sure that people understand. I don't know if you've been here for the Leviticus theories that uh, Pastor Greg taught a while ago, but you need to understand that this is a, 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 he's talking about types of peace offerings. And I would imagine that there, he's talking about two different offerings, although he doesn't say explicitly, when he talks about the fact that he's doing uh, a Thanksgiving offering and a vow offering. He's offering up his vows. It's not just something you say, it's something you go and do. When he was in distress, he was saying, Lord, I, I vow that I'm going to uh, go back and I'm going to honor you, you know, with the appropriate sacrifice. So he's talking about doing a peace offering. And you see this described in great detail. We don't have the time tonight, but in Leviticus 7, there's really three types of, of uh, peace offerings. There's a thanksgiving, a vow, and a voluntary peace offering. The thanksgiving involves leaven, and he talks explicitly about doing a thanksgiving offering, and he talks about a vow offering, which does not include leaven. So from my mind, I'm kind of thinking he's done both of them. Or in some of the in, uh, translations that you look at or some of the commentaries think it's one. He's doing one, but uh, it's not clear to me if they understand the difference between them. But both of them include a drink offering, and he talks about a cup of salvation. We talk about the cup of, uh, you know, the, the, the third cup, the cup of redemption, which is not necessarily the cup of salvation, but it could be interpreted that way, that they drank it. But it, it could also be this cup that, that's a libation. As part of this, is a, this drink offering is a libation. You, it's poured out along with the, the, the meat offering. And it's also done in the courts in the temple in Jerusalem. And, and the important thing here is that he says, I'm going to do it in front of the people, right? I'm going to do it at the courts. So he's clearly talking about doing this kind of an offering. And it's the only offering, as I understand it, where the offerer gets a portion of it back. So he gets to eat some of it. It doesn't all get burned or it doesn't all go to the priest. He gets some of that offering. So I think that makes it very special that God has reached out to him and delivered him when he cried out to him. And God, and he does his part by offering the vow, and then he gets part of that offering back. And then finally, I just want to summarize again some of the hints or visions of Yeshua, Jesus, that you see in this psalm. He sang Psalm 116. You see in Matthew 26 and Mark 14, I'll give you the reference for it. It said they sang hymns after dinner, after the Passover dinner. This concept of the inclined ear and the zero and the outstretched arm and the outstretched ear. We see that Peter quoted from Psalm 116 on the day of Pentecost. And we didn't cover it, but... It's in there. The Apostle Paul identified with quotes of Psalm 116 where he uses the phrase, I believe, therefore I spoke. Okay, that's very much reminiscent of, you know, Romans 10, 9, and 10 where you confess with the mouth and believe in the heart. It's the same thing here. So he had this experience where he believed and that caused him to be bold in his proclamation in spite of dire circumstances. And he quotes this guy, this psalmist, who says the very same thing about, I believe, therefore I spoke. You can see that it's in the notes. And then this concept of death, tears, and, and uh, stumbling. Yeshua, after the Passover, in the garden, right, on the way to the cross, in the grave, and then he's resurrected. And then finally, this concept of a cup of salvation. Right, we see it as that Passover cup. We see it as as uh, the drink offering poured out, and the many connotations to being poured out as a drink offering that you see Paul speak about. So that, to me, is, in a nutshell, the Reader's Digest version of Psalm 116. Hope you found it useful. God bless.